Thank you for joining us. We'll give folks a few seconds to join and begin shortly. Good afternoon for those on the West Coast. Good evening for those on the East Coast. Welcome to our conversation this afternoon and evening about ending girls incarceration in Santa Clara County, California. A few housekeeping announcements before we begin. This webinar is being recorded. We'll take your questions starting at 3.15. To ask a question, please type it into the chat or in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. Thank you, and I'll hand it over to my colleague, Lindsay. Thank you, Renuka, and thanks everyone for joining us for this really important conversation. I'm Lindsay Rosenthal, the Director of the Initiative to End Girls Incarceration here at the Barrett Institute, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. Every year, there's approximately 41,000 detentions of girls and gender expansive youth across the country, and the goal of our initiative is to bring that down to zero by 2030. California is critical to the fight to get to zero because of its size of the state it's more than 16% of girls in placement nationwide. And we believe that California can lead the way showing other states that this work is not only important, but also possible. We know that getting to zero is an ambitious goal, but it's well within reach for any jurisdiction in the country that's willing to prioritize it. And soon you'll hear more from leaders in Santa Clara County who came together to do just that. And you'll see the results they were able to achieve. We don't do this work alone at Bureau. We do it in close partnership with incredible group of advocates, organizers, government champions, young people and funders who are committed to working towards a future where girls and gender expansive youth of color are healthy, safe, and free in their communities. We're lucky to be joined by several of our close partners this morning, afternoon, and I'm honored to be able to introduce Alex Johnson, Interim Vice President of Programs at California Wellness Foundation. Alex has been a key partner to us as we, as we built out this work in California, offering thought partnership and strategic advice, believing in our vision, and all while holding a holistic lens that centers healing and wellness for girls and gender expansive, expansive youth of color. And there are two specific things that I'd wanna thank Alex for. The first is prioritizing girls of color in a field that often doesn't um, make time and space to do that. And then the other is for being a collaborative funder that um, supported and invested in our work in a way that valued our collaboration with community partners um, and was able to help strengthen our partnership with the Young Women's Freedom Center. So thank you for your support, Alex, and for joining us uh, today. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Lindsay, and uh, thank you to Vera Institute. Um, it's such a pleasure to uh, join each of you uh, today for this a really important conversation. I'm excited uh, to help facilitate this discussion today. Uh, let me just offer a bit of context uh, in addition to what Lindsay uh, has said uh, so eloquently. Uh, women and, and girls of color are a growing purport, proportion of California's uh, justice system. Uh, but for too long, they've simply just been an afterthought in reform efforts and to the funders that support those efforts. Justice reform efforts have systematically excluded girls and gender expansive youth from policy analysis, programmatic investments, and research advancements. At the same time, a traditional gender-based work has not centered girls and gender expansive youth of color or young people with justice system involvement. But we know uh, that communities cannot thrive when women, girls, and gender expansive young folks continue to face criminalization, arrest, incarceration, and violence at the hands of the legal system. Uh, too often, the experiences that girls have with violence and trauma bring them into direct contact with the justice system that only serves to cause greater harm. This work cannot exist in a vacuum. The health and wellness of communities is affected and is Im impacted by our race, our class, our gender, our disability, and past involvement with the criminal justice system. At Cal Wellness, we are committed to taking a holistic approach. What does that mean? It means identifying, lifting up, and helping to shift the often invisible systemic barriers, policies, and practices 
that reinforce existing inequity and uniquely marginalized girls and gender expansive youth of color. It means shifting power and resources to communities while investing in programming and supports that young people and their communities tell us they need and that they want. When we first began engaging in discussions with Vera, they had just launched a national effort to end girls incarceration, starting with five jurisdictions across the country, including Santa Clara County. We knew and we could tell that something special was happening uh, in Santa Clara. And we were excited to support both Vera and the Young Women's Freedom Center to work in partnership with other community and government champions to take a holistic approach to ending girls' incarceration. Vera plays a unique and critical role in this space, bringing together government leaders, community-based organizations, advocates, and young people to explore and understand data on their local systems, identify system gaps and policy barriers, and develop and pilot new ideas driven by both traditional data analysis and what young people say they need. The panel can talk a bit more about how the work has looked and some of the major successes, but to lay it out, the County of Santa Clara has seen a nearly 60% decline in girls' annual admissions to Juvenile Hall between the years of 2018 and 2020. And last year, the county touched zero for the first time. This year, the county has had two consecutive weeks with zero girls admitted to Juvenile Hall. And this summer, they've had a consistent average daily population of just one girl in custody. We're excited to continue to support Vera as they look to take this work statewide to translate lessons learned from Santa Clara and to scale the partnership model to other counties across the state. Early next year, with Kyle Mona's support, Vera and Young Women's Freedom Center will be releasing a report that will, for the first time, detail the number of girls in detention and placement county by county across the state. The report will share policy recommendations for statewide reform developed in partnership with directly impacted women, girls, and gender expansive young people. So I am thrilled this afternoon to uh, introduce an impressive group of leaders from across government and the community in Santa Clara to share more with us about how this work has looked. Uh, please welcome Hannah Green, who is a program manager on Vera's Ending Girls Incarceration Team, Jessica Nallen, who is the executive director of the Young Women's Freedom Center, the Honorable Catherine Lucero, who is the presiding judge of the Juvenile Division in Santa Clara County, Julie Ramirez, who is the Interim Executive Director of the Office of Women's Policy in Santa Clara County, and Marcia Rincon Gallardo, who is the Executive Director of Alianza for Youth Justice. I wanna start with Hannah. And Hannah, I'm gonna ask you to set the stage for us just a bit more. Uh, we know that women and girls of color are a growing proportion of California's justice system. But when Vera and Young Women's Freedom Center first started on this journey, there wasn't widely available data or information about girls and gender expansive youth in the justice system. So can you share just a bit more about the need and the urgency for this work and how Vera is helping to address it? Hannah. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Alex, and, and hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here this afternoon and to get a chance to celebrate some of the incredible work that's been happening in Santa Clara County. And I, I have to just share that I heard from Judge Lucero this morning that the county is currently at zero. They don't have any girls in custody right now. So it's something that's become relatively routine for them, but really exciting and, and really worth celebrating. So I wanted to lift that up. Um, and thank you also to Alex for, for your steadfast commitment to this work. Um, you know, as you mentioned in your opening remarks, girls and gender expansive youth of color, particularly Black, Latinx, Indigenous youth, experience unique forms of marginalization and harm at the hands of the justice system. The system is used to police their bodies, to punish them for daring to fight back against violence and discrimination, or in a perverse attempt to keep them safe from harm. So nationally, we know that an estimated 85% of girls are incarcerated for misdemeanor or non-criminal violations. 
they're being held in custody either for their own protection or to connect them to treatment or services. But arrest and incarceration only exacerbate and magnify the harms that are caused by other forms of state and interpersonal violence. And the young people in girls' facilities are overwhelmingly survivors of violence. They're often also foster youth who have been criminalized because of the aftermath of trauma or the efforts that they took to resist and survive that trauma. And as you mentioned, without an explicit gender lens, girls and gender expansive youth of color are too often left behind in movements for racial equity or, or criminal justice reform work. So we do this work because we believe that girls and gender expansive youth matter. Their joy matters, their freedom matters. They deserve to have people fighting for and with them. And we're working towards a vision of zero. That means zero youth in custody on the girls' side of the juvenile justice system across the country, across the state by 2030. It means zero girls in any mandated out-of-home placement as a result of contact with the justice system. You know, for, for too long, the, the criminal justice system has seen its role as fixing broken girls rather than addressing the systems of violence and discrimination that are harming girls and gender expansive youth in the first place. And we really see our role is to flip that on its head. We're focused on fixing broken systems, on directing resources toward community-based solutions that, that meaningfully advance freedom and self-determination for girls and gender expansive youth. So we work in jurisdictions across the country. We're in New York City, Hawaii, Maine, here in Santa Clara County in California. In each of these sites, we use a collaborative change process, bringing together perspectives and expertise from government, community-based organizations, advocates, directly impacted young people to understand local drivers of girls' incarceration and then develop solutions to, to get to zero. And we'll talk a little bit more about what those solutions have looked like in Santa Clara um, in a moment. Um, I, I think the last thing I'd say is no one organization can tackle this problem alone. And everything we do, we do in really close partnership with government and community. And in California in particular, we are really lucky to have built a deep partnership with the Young Women's Freedom Center. It's allowed us to effectively use a collective impact strategy on the ground in, in Santa Clara that we've seen be really effective. So we're excited to, to get a chance to lift up leadership from all of our partners in, in Santa Clara and um, join them on a statewide movement to get to zero. So thank you. Thank you uh, for that. I, I want to quickly move us along. I want to bring uh, Jessica uh, into this conversation. And actually, Hannah, I want you to stay around. I uh, will have a uh, want to pose this question to you as, as well. But Jessica, uh, you know, it's, it's wonderful to have you uh, here today. Um, so many of us just continue to be inspired uh, by your leadership and that of uh, the Young Women's Freedom Center. I continue uh, and still reflect on our first meeting uh, back when we could meet uh, and you laid out your vision for the organization. But uh, uh, Vera and Young Women's Freedom Center both started uh, working in Santa Clara in 2018. And uh, the strength of that partnership uh, between Vera the Young Women's Freedom Center and the county uh, has been really integral to the success uh, of this work. Uh, so can you tell us, just give us some, some, some uh, background as to what was it uh, about Santa Clara of all places that brought uh, both of your organizations, Young Women's Freedom Center and Vera together to partner? Uh, and can you tell us what that partnership has looked like between Vera and Young Women's Freedom Center and the county? Jessica. Hey, Alex, I remember that first meeting too. <laughs> that was really awesome. I'm super glad to be here. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, um, so, um, you know, Santa Clara had a, has a gender responsive task force and was looking at models, um, you know, under uh, Judge Lucero's leadership around decarceration um, and around providing services outside of the system to, to you know, young women, gender expansive youth, and had come to do a couple of visits at Young Women's Freedom Center in San Francisco, where we've been at the time for about 25 years. And, um, you know, we had also been working with Vera, um, who at the time when New York City had said, okay, we're going to get to zero. Um, you know, the center is kind of nationally recognized as a model um, to support the leadership, the self-determination of, of young women and gender expansive young people, um, and to really advocate uh, to push to for 27 years now for radical transformation of systems. And so um, it was in Chicago, actually, um, at the Policy Link Conference, where I had a chance to sit down with Judge Lucero. Um, and, and like this moment of connection between, um, 
you and I judge um, really allowed me to see your specific leadership and the the like commitment to like we do not have to incarcerate um, these young people. Um, and I think I like to tell that story because you know we're also very unwavering in our model. And in that conversation, I, I, I told Judge Lucetto, we don't take law enforcement money and we want to expand our work. Um, and so I will say Santa Clara and Vera, I, I know that when you guys, uh, Vera had put out an announcement for, we're going to expand the work from New York nationally. And it everything just kind of came together at one time. I know, I think it was Judge Lucetto who did that application. Um, we had said, okay, we will come down and explore this um, because, you know, our commitment and our vision is if we want to radically transform the world, we need radically different leaders. And so beyond just any incarceration, our model is to invest deeply in these young people's leadership. And so by all of us being in this county, I think what's been so instrumental is that we all have the same goal right? Like the deep commitment to these young people, to their self-determination, to their futures, um, and to the communities. And we've really all been able to work in our own wheelhouse, kind of, right? Of like, you know, what do we do well? And how do we really, beyond, you know, Vera um, and Young Women's Freedom Center, but everyone on this call, Officer Women's Policy, Marcia, um, and so much more to really, um, to me, it's not innovative. It's just like, duh. But at the same time for a county to, to really develop innovative strategies. So um, um, yeah, and I think by not having this funding exchange between a community-based organization um, and probation or, or the district attorney's office, it allows us to build authentic real relationships, center the young people um, and, and move from that place. So I guess I could stop there, but that's, I think, some of the ingredients that have um, been able to, to create so much success. Jessica, I wanna thank you for that. It's, it's always helpful to uh, really understand and uh, have a sense of the origin story of how uh, these types of partnerships uh, come to uh, fruition. And so Hannah, I wanna ask you the, uh, the same question. Um, uh, tell us Vera's side and, and, and how you were able to uh, help forge um, this this connection, this partnership, uh, and what was it for, for Vera that uh, caused you to say, hey, Santa Clara is where we're going to plant our flag uh, and help to, to see this work? Yeah, I think... Um... You know, it's funny, our, our journey into Santa Clara also started as a result of really intentional outreach from Judge Lucero and other folks in the, the Gender Responsive Task Force, OWP. Um, you know, we, as, as Jess mentioned, in 2018, we had put out an RFP asking jurisdictions from across the country to apply to work with us, receive no-cost technical assistance. We knew we wanted to work in California. Um, it's strategically important for us, as, as Lindsay mentioned before, I think the, you know, it has the highest number of girls and gender expansive youth in, in placement. Um, but when Santa Clara applied, we had a chance to meet um, the, the government and community leaders who had submitted the application, and we could just immediately tell that there was something special in, in the county. Um, you know, as, as Jessica mentioned, it's really, uh, it's really rare to meet um, a leader like Judge Lucero, leaders like Julie um, in government who are willing to so forcefully um, and clearly talk about and recognize the harms of the system and really be invested in um, shifting power and resources into community and investing in the leadership of, of young people. And so um, it was really inspiring to, to get to hear that straight from government. And at the same time, there was this really strong base of community-based organizations and leaders like Marcia who had been fighting to center gender within the youth justice space and really working to hold government accountable to community um, already. And then on top of that, um, we had Jess and YWFC coming into to San Jose um, and building a really strong base there um, to, to build the leadership of, of young folks and girls and gender expansive youth of color. And you know, Jess already talked a little bit about the, the deep partnership that we have, but I just reemphasize how critical it's been for us to all be working together from the beginning to strategize, build out ideas, bring young folks to the table, 
Um, and I, I think I just reemphasize what Jess said that we've built a really consistent and clear message that's in community and within government that the county can and should be ending girls incarceration. And so we're seeing folks really listening and, and acting on that. But thank you. And I wanna make sure to invite uh, our audience to um, weigh in uh, with questions. We'll raise them later for our panelists. Uh, but let me turn to um, uh, our, 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 our county uh, partners um, who, as you said, Hannah, have uh, really been able to, uh, you, in a very unique fashion, um, lean in to uh, support um, and wrap their arms around uh, what really is a tremendous uh, partnership, and I've watched it firsthand. And, uh, when we began this conversation, uh, we uh, cited and made reference uh, to the almost 60% decline in girls' admissions uh, to detention. Uh, we talked about the county uh, touching uh, zero for the first time um, uh, last year, uh, and then hitting zero uh, again this year as a regular occurrence. And so Judge Lucero, uh, Julia Marcia, I wanna bring you in um, uh, and I'm gonna start with Judge Lucero. Um, tell us what it has taken uh, to get to this point uh, and what changes uh, have had to happen, what changes have had to occur uh, as a result of this, uh, this partnership and where have you seen uh, really the change uh, in the system uh, that you uh, have worked within um, as really uh, one of the best jurists I've ever encountered as a recovery lawyer. And so just Lucero, let me uh, just uh, ask you to respond to that. The changes, what did it take? Mm -hmm. uh, where are you seeing real change? So yes, thank you, Alex. Thank you everyone for um, giving me an opportunity to share today. Um, I do wanna um, just go back a little bit and, and um, when we saw the opportunity to um, apply for the TA um, grant from Vera. Um, you know, I, I'm a I'm a huge believer in consensus leadership, um, and the campaign to end the incarceration of girls was a whole phraseology that we were not used to hearing in Santa Clara County. In fact, when we first started the Gender Responsive Task Force, we were focused primarily on how to accommodate girls services, uh, gender responsive services in custodial settings. Um, I was approached by probation and by um, the Office of Women's Policy uh, early on when I got over here in 2014 from the, um, I had been working in family court and prior to that, the child welfare courts. And um, we sadly had um, at that time, we were just worried about not doing more harm for our girls in custody. We weren't even thinking yet about just not even having them in the door. Um, and so when we were able to get wind of this opportunity to actually end the incarceration of girls, which by the way, Nick Burchard, our deputy chief in charge of institutions, who was a co-chair of the gender uh, responsive task force and an early adopter of this leadership, he kept saying, why are we creating more programming for girls in custody? Why aren't we getting girls out of custody or making it so that they don't even come in at all? And so, um, when I saw the technical assistance bulletin, I started trying on the phrase, you know, let's end the incarceration of girls in Santa Clara County. And um, it took a while to, to sow the, you know, to sow the field and, and, and so, so that the seed could be planted. Um, and so, you know, I'd be talking to the DA and we, by the way, the district attorney is at our gender responsive task force table. And I would talk about this opportunity. And then, and then I said, you know, I think I'm going to apply. I think we should apply to end the incarceration of girls in Santa Clara County. And so I kept um, having to make sure that everybody heard me correctly. And I wanted, again, the consensus. And so everybody said, no problem, we'll do it, judge. I got everybody on board and, um, and we got it. And uh, I'm so grateful because um, I do believe it takes an outside catalyst to shake up an inside, um, an insider um, kind of, um, you know, culture, frankly. And even those of us who may be visionary and who may 
um, really believe in um, uh, not incarcerating youth um, need tools and we need help with our vision and we need help to be brave with our speech and our um, actions. And I don't know that, to be honest, if Vera hadn't had this opportunity, if we would have gotten here because we did need that outside catalyst. And that's why this work is so important to counties and state jurisdictions. Um, so we brought in, we also brought in behavioral health and you know many other CBOs. And we, we broke out of this initial vision of just serving girls well in confinement. Um, as a judge, as you can imagine, I have a front row seat to witness the harmful impacts of our justice system on young people. And I believe it is incumbent upon us as system leaders to fully confront uh, structural racism, uh, sexism, historical, the historical context that we find our youth being, um, you know, uh, drawn in and, 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 and almost like a, a cyclone getting deeper and deeper into systems. And I think that we have the responsibility to fix it, to fix our systems, not to fix our kids. And I think that's really my, um, my, my vision is that we do systems um, shifting and, and reform so that our systems serve people and we don't have people serving our systems. And if we fix our systems and we have them be youth and family centered, we're telling our youth, youth and our families that we care about them. And this work is all about um, using that compassion lens because every single person that comes to my courtroom has a traumatic life history. Um, I have rarely met anybody that just ends up in a juvenile justice system that um, came here, you know, from a Leave It to Beaver family. Sorry for those of you who are too young to understand that reference. But, um, you know, when you place a kind of a middle class primary culture lens on a population of people who have ha had um, um, really um, no chance at access to real justice for three or 400 years, it's not fair. That's not justice. And so that compassion lens that healing centered um, um, drive to heal families and do no harm is really important to me. So we embarked on the, um, the, uh, you know, the journey with Vera. The first thing that we did, and Marcia was a huge champion of this, is data. What's the data sh showing us? Um, and so Vera did a data analysis. We did a self-assessment. They pulled every girl incarcerated in 2018 and they analyzed who that girl is. And then they showed us who we were incarcerating as a system. And lo and behold, just as Marcia had said, it was low to medium risk girls. And that's on our um, risk assessment index and our juvenile uh, assessment index. And that is not who we um, should have been incarcerating. And um, I'm sure that, or I don't know if Vera is going to talk later about what we found, but what we found was that uh, the criminogenic orientation of these girls really was pretty non-existent. We had girls that had between you know, 10 to 40 CPS referrals, chronic homelessness, generational parent parental incarceration. So we've been, we've been able to do that self-assessment, get real, look under the hood, tell on ourselves, and then shift shift course. And because of that, we've been able to implement practice changes within the court. And one of the primary things we've done is we've stopped incarcerating girls for their own good. Um, that's an old refrain that is um, based purely really on um, a system convenience to make us feel better, but it doesn't make anybody else feel better, especially not the girl or the gender expansive youth. And the way we did that is we, we came together and um, I was very specific to say that, you know, juvenile hall is not a motel and um, it is a jail. And um, we have a lot of science, adolescent brain development. We have a lot of information that tells us that even just coming to court as a juvenile is harmful, let alone staying incarcerated. So um, we share, again, we, we responded, we looked at the data and then we started developing, um, you know, ways to keep girls out of custody. And it took a lot of us, it took DFCS, our Department of Family and Children's Services. It took the Young Women's Freedom Center. It took probation to look at what's happening at the entry um, and, and getting 
we talked to Bay Area Legal Aid about how judges could put girls in other placements that weren't 300 child welfare placements and when they couldn't go home because many of our girls are not able to go home even though they're not in the foster care system. So the practical changes that we made are many. Um, we are seeing um, a, a whole system going towards services instead of surveillance. In fact, today we only have three girls on the electronic monitoring program. We have no girls on the community release program. We are um, coming to terms that girls are different and that girls need a different response. But it's not just in the custodial setting. In fact, it's in the soup to nuts treatment of how we um, approach um, this population. So thank you for letting me tell that story. Thank you, Judge Lucero. Uh, so many just nuggets uh, uh, in, the, in what you said. Uh, we need to fix our system and fix our systems and not fix our kids. Um, and not having people serving our systems, just uh, reflecting on, on all that you said. Let me bring uh, Julie uh, and Marcia uh, in. Uh, as well, uh, I want to pose the same question uh, to you uh, from where you said, uh, really just take us through, uh, and we'll start with Julie, uh, some of the changes that you have witnessed um, as a result of this partnership. Um, and uh, any insight uh, from your perspective on uh, where have you seen the real change and what it took to actually get there? So Julie? Sure, thank you, Alex. I'd, I'd love to share a little bit about the Office of Women's Policy first, because there aren't very many across the country. We're one of a few and elevating that gender um, perspective and gender lens is so important and critical to this work. And I think part, part of the success, but justice has always been a part of our mission and the county of Santa Clara has extended that, that commitment to social justice as a priority through the creation of the Division of Equity and Social Justice, which our office is a part of. And again, I think that is a real contributor to changing the mindset as Judge Lucero um, expressed earlier on, on this shift in culture um, with systems leaders being brave enough to speak up and say that it is our goal to end incarceration. Um, I also want to emphasize the importance that that data analysis did. And while we collected data for years, we never took that, um, took the steps to do that analysis, which really laid the foundation and reinforced what those hunches were. So sharing that information across these collaborative spaces in the county, combined with the leadership of, of those doing the work in other spaces like the Young Women's Freedom Center, really, really solidified um, the importance of doing this work. The other point that I wanted to make was related to COVID because COVID really played an important role and was actually an accelerator for reform. COVID crystallized that we were keeping risk in harmful congregate, congregate settings unnecessarily. We had done a lot of groundwork with Vera before COVID to understand the data and to begin to develop practical solutions that could fill system gaps and actually get us to zero. But it wasn't until COVID came that we were able to take this bold action and say, we've got, we've got solutions right here that have been developed in partnership and that can work. And they listened. So now we see government leaders across the county acknowledging that zero is possible and committing making that commitment to this goal as well. In fact, the county has um, a task force called the CEDAW task force, CEDAW being the convention to eliminate all forms of discrimination against women. And this task force also elevated this goal of ending girls incarceration by 2024. And they will be sending this recommendation to the board to really echo the sentiment that we're seeing supported by so many county leaders um, um, in, in various departments. Over the past few months, we've worked with Vera and Marcia to lead this task force through a re-envisioning process. The group, which includes government leaders, community leaders, and directly impacted young people, 
we agreed on a mission statement that is explicit in its ultimate goal of ending incarceration. And we're focused now on expanding access to housing and to economic supports to prevent girls from ever sitting in detention because there's no safe alternatives. So that's what we're focused on now. Thank you so much, Marcia. Hi. So um, thank you, Alex. Thank you, Vera, for inviting me um, to be here and um, and you know share along with. Uh, Jessica from the Young Women's Freedom Center and our champion, Judge Lucero, and then our colleagues from the Office of Women's Policy. You know, here at the Alianza, we're just really um, honored to be able to participate. Um, we're a national organization that really looks at ending mass incarceration for brown youth. And we, we you know, the, my newest little tagline is that it's brown solutions for brown youth. And so here in Santa Clara, wow, it was an opportunity to really put uh, experience that we've had from all over the country to see that number one, there's Latino youth in every single state. And number two, the way that we look at the data sometimes keeps us invisible. And so here in Santa Clara County, from the very first day, I had the fortune of Jesucero inviting me to join the, the, young, uh, the Gender Responsive Task Force. And I remember that day, you know, it was like I had gone in to do a hearing and um, and she came after me and said, hey, you know, we think we really need you in this uh, gender responsive task force. And I was someone who was actually doing more of this work at a national level, but I live here and um, and it matters to me what is happening in my local jurisdiction, my, my local county. And so I did get involved and started attending. And what I realized was very little data would ever show up at these monthly meetings. And you know, we always talk about, well, how many times in a year will we meet? And how many times can we actually look at the data that will tell us something about how successful we're actually becoming um, in, in the ways in which we're doing this work? Fortunately, I had had experience doing reform work around the country. And what I realized was that while we invest a lot in systems, we rarely, rarely ever invest in our communities to be able to sit at advocacy tables, whether it's our formally system impacted young people or their families, or just advocates that want to help. So the Alianza got involved and we realized that by investing, developing a, um, a curriculum that uh, expanded the leadership of formerly system impacted young people to be able to understand the lexicon, the history, uh, the reform models and use methodology, looking at data, talking about data in policy discussion tables, that that is what we most wanted. And so um, we kept pushing for data and broken down by race and ethnicity. And lo and behold, Latinos are 35% of the population in Santa Clara and 70% of our girls were brown girls and youth, uh, gender expansive youth. And so we really understood that the voices of these girls and gender expansive youth along with their families needed to be heard at these meetings. So, you know, we partnered with the Vera Institute. We were ecstatic at hearing when there's that political will for a judge to, to actually say end incarceration, we were fully on board and we, we backed it up. We backed up uh, the Young Women's Freedom Center being able to come here and, and participate in our community, all our other community-based organizations, the Office of Women's Policy, and Vera to really lead a robust questioning, constantly looking at the data and not backing off. Uh, if we're gonna do these uh, innovations, is it actually moving the dial in how many girls are actually sitting in detention. Um, and so, you know, uh, really being insistent, even with the pushback, uh, we realized that um, the transparency that Vera was able to uh, bring in and really translate that whatever data was being looked at could be shared with everyone in this committee, including community folks. And so we understood that um, having capacity to look at data, to hold our systems accountable and all of us accountable was where we most felt comfortable in being able to continue to support this effort. 
we're really honored. We're really pleased, but we know there's still some uh, steps to go. It's a curb cut effect. If we can do this for girls, we know that we could do this for the rest of our young people, including our boys. And we declare that we wanna be able to close down um, Juvenile Hall by 2024. And we say that openly and publicly because if we don't, we won't get there. And so we're really pleased to be able to participate. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that and for those thoughtful uh, comments. I mean, you mentioned something um, uh, uh, that we know that there's much more work uh, to be to be done. And I want to sort of shift us a bit and, and open it up uh, for the full uh, panel. Uh, how do you build on? How do you sustain the progress that has been made? What is what is next for this this work? And Judge Sarah, let me. Uh, start with you, uh, and then Marcia, I want you to, to jump in um, uh, next as well. Thank you, Alex. Um, yeah, so the work is is never done um, because um, we're a dynamic um, system, but I think that it, that we are doing our best to start formalizing um, some of the practice changes. Um, I forgot to mention that we now issue discretionary warrants for our girls who uh, are on runaway, which I actually want to rephrase. I, I don't like the term runaway. Um, I think, um, so anyway, I'm working on that. But, um, and that means that when the girl is located, that she doesn't have to see a judge before she's released. That means the probation officer can see that she's safe and then keep her out of custody. Um, we also have monthly report outs at our gender responsive task force of the girls in custody. So having to come once a month to talk with all of these um, folks, sometimes, I don't know, 20, 30 at a time, um, I need to know who's in custody, what their risk assessment index is and why they're in custody. And so that's created a huge amount of transparency. I'm also working with all the judges, um, including our dependency court judges to develop some new processes for our duly involved youth from, uh, I, don't, I don't want them in detention for violating child welfare orders. We tend to issue protective custody warrants for those young girls and gender expansive youth. So they're not gonna come into police custody, they'll come into social worker custody. And because the numbers have uh, dropped so significantly, we are a we're able to focus our attention on resources on the smaller number of girls that we're seeing, you know, one or two at a time uh, entering our system. We're really able to clarify what are the issues. They're very often housing solutions and places to be solutions. I don't want to say placement because that's kind of a term of art, but um, we are seeing that we need a uh, a place for our youth to be where they are safe, where they are not in custody and they're not in a 300 uh, court proceeding. Um, Julie mentioned the work that Vera is leading with probation to explore temporary housing solutions. Um, we have the support of our board of supervisors to begin researching and developing alternatives to incarceration or our youth um, having to live on the street in unsafe conditions. Um, and now, um, again, our numbers are so low that we're forced to reckon with this issue of as numbers go down, racial disparities go up. And why is that, that sometimes we have, if we have only two girls in custody, they're both Latinx, or if we have one girl in custody, she's Black. Um, we're really able to see clearly that intergenerational trauma and racial oppression that keeps surfacing and it's a mirror for what we've done to indigenous black and brown people for generations. And our system is the, is the, is the mirror that keeps, um, you know, they say that systems work exactly how they were designed to work. And our, our system keeps mirroring that back to us. So we need to start having these uncomfortable conversations and taking what we've learned through the work with the gender responsive task force force and um, addressing the needs of girls and gender expansive youth and applying it in other contents. Context. Um, for example, um, looking closer at, at, at charges for violent offenses and now with DJJ realignment and the secure track facilities. And we have to share out and highlight the successes in our county with other um, with other jurisdictions. And we've been trying to do that for a while. We've had some success. Uh, recently, we had uh, convening. Uh, we had a very good turnout of regional 
Uh, I think we had about 15 to 20 jurisdictions join us and there is hunger for regional work. I don't want to keep a girl incarcerated because she has a warrant out in San Mateo County or Fresno County. I don't want to have to keep a girl in custody because we can't provide services to her when she's out of custody in her home in a different county. But that is the state of the law and that is the state of the protocols. We need to change those and that's why we need to have a bigger vision. This is the tip of the iceberg, one county out of 58. I, I want to abolish justice by geography. I want a young person, a girl or a gender expansive youth or a boy to know that when if I have to you know, meet up with a judge in any county, I'm gonna have similar outcomes that I would in Santa Clara County. There are days I lose sleep over that, whether or not to transfer a case to another county, because I know, for example, that they don't use diversion, or I know that they are you know, famously the data showing some pretty famous um, bias, racial bias outcomes. I don't want that anymore for our children. I want our children to have uh, stability and consistency and their families to have stability and consistency. So this work needs to be supported. And um, I am here to act as um, a, a subject matter expert for any other uh, judge or probation department. And I have said so many times at the public level. Thanks, Judge Lucero. Uh, let me uh, go back to Marcia and, and then also bring in Jessica. Uh, um, Marcia, similar question, you know, what's next uh, from your perspective uh, for uh, this work and uh, for partnerships like this? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. I think it's profound. Um, we are investing in assuring that not only, you know, uh, we have a lot of partners that already invest in young people, but we hire we make sure that young people have the supports that they need. Uh, and we're talking about directly impacted young people to be able to um, be the leaders in this. Um, we're also expanding to families. So in this case, we wanna be able to bring in Latino, Spanish speaking families that have experienced and had to unsuccessfully navigate these systems to hear from them, what is it that needs to change? The other thing is that we believe strongly that our communities, they have everything that they need in order to shift and transform these systems, to really rely on what lives in our, in our communities. We talk a lot about la cultura cura, so culture cures, and those methodologies to be able to, uh, instead of being a punitive approach, that we actually share love and compassion and empathy with our young people who are going through trauma. Um, so much of, you know, we have a wonderful um, professor from ASU, Vera Lopez, who did some excellent research about perceptions of judges, per, uh, prosecutors, probation about our girls. And that research tells us that they think that our girls are uh, more violent, less willing to, to be in treatment. Uh, less willing to uh, obey, you know, the, these kinds of perceptions that make our girls stay longer and go deeper in the system. And we really have to take that into consideration. What are uh, uh, the system thinking about our young people that make them stay longer and go deeper? The research has always been there. The methodologies, you know, how much does our, um, our community know that they have self-determination and agency to push back that probation has and the system has these methodologies to uh, say to release young people. We know the whole Bay Area uh, detains two thirds of all young people are low and medium risk by their own instruments. And yet these kids still remain in, in the system. And how much does it cost when if we were transform that cost to community-based organizations that we know are much more effective, why is it that we're not doing that? And that's the push, the push and pull. It's the opportunity that Vera gives us to be able to have these transparent discussions and hard, difficult discussions to be able to change and transform these systems by bringing families and young people who are most impacted to the table. That's really where the discussion needs to be. And that's where we're gonna focus. Thank you. Um, um, uh, Jessica, let me uh, uh, ask you to respond uh, from the vantage point of Young Women's Freedom Center, um, 
what do you see as as next? And I want to add another layer uh, to this. How do you sustain this work? Uh, and specifically, uh, let me ask, because uh, I work in philanthropy, I, uh, how can philanthropy uh, further support this type of work? Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, one thing this it, it always makes me think of is, you know, I'm uh, the Young Women's Freedom Center is literally investing in the young people who've been most impacted to lead. Um, and that's been our model for 27 years, right? Like, I think that while data is so important, also, if you talk to me or my colleagues in 1996, we were young people that were incarcerated that would tell you the same things, right? Like, we want jobs, we need resources, and our family needs resources. The difference is who's listening to those young people and taking them seriously. Um, and I think that, you know, the by Vera being able to go in and actually look at case files, it gives us information that allows the system to move, right? Because at the end of the day, with all my privilege as a white woman, as an executive director, I'm also a formerly incarcerated seventh grade dropout. And so my, um, what I know and what our communities know, what Marcia was talking about, that wealth of knowledge is not taken seriously. Um, and so I think that what we, what my call to philanthropy is to invest deeply in organizations um, on the ground, intermediaries in this ecosystem that says, no, uh, com poor communities of color actually know, um, have the answers, need to, to lead. Um, and it's, it's a long game, right? Like, I feel so privileged to be here. Um, you know, I came to the center in 1996. And we were talking about ending incarceration, we were working with critical resistance and Angela Davis and like, understanding like, wait, I'm not a bad kid, like there's something larger at play. And if I think like the conversations that were happening there, and now we're in 2021, right? It's like, it's been all of the work that folks have put in that's allowed us to arrive at this moment. Um, and we have so much further to go, like so much further to go. If we're talking about, you know, um, you know, even the housing, you know, universal basic income. And, and I think that's a good thing to look at because there's this explosion across the country right now of all these pilots. And what I know to be true when you talk to folks who've been in deep poverty all their lives is like pilots that are only giving you $200 that don't make any actual change in your ability to change the conditions in your life you know, it, it's not going to work, right? So I think that like we have these moments now. Um, so I guess the call to philanthropy is to fund um, deep, long term. Um, and then also, I guess, for sustainability, is that I have a staff of 70. The majority, about 70% are directly impacted. And we have a lot of other folks that come in and want to do great work. But I'm going to tell you who shows up in COVID or when there's crisis who are like, I don't care if I'm off the clock, I'm working 24 hours a day. It's the people that are most impacted and have that like, these are my family, these are my communities. And they're the ones that will burn out fast too. And that are working for the smallest wages, the longest amount of hours. And we need to be able to think about as we're, you know, towards abolition, if I'm allowed to say that here, or radical reform that we have to build a new ecosystem where folks, it's not just about taking system people and now letting them be the employers of this new ecosystem, right? It's about investing in our communities to lead this work. Um, we need to pay people well and folks need to be able to take care of themselves and their families. Um, and so, yeah, th those are all things that I think uh, are important. Thank you, Jessica. I, I just wanna quickly pivot because uh, a number of times, uh, panelists have, have mentioned uh, uh, and talked about uh, housing related issues and housing related uh, solutions. And so Julie, let me just uh, quickly pivot and ask you um, briefly just to give us 
uh, some thinking about how uh, Santa Clara is uh, viewing uh, uh, these the, the need for, for more housing related solutions in the context of uh, this gender responsive work. Right, well, it's important to just recognize for anybody across the country, we're in the San Francisco Bay Area and housing has been a crisis preceding COVID for you know decades and decades. Um, but COVID, you know, and this response to to end incarceration, or this campaign to end incarceration, is really elevating this need. And and we view housing as a form of prevention. It's not only a solution, but it's for further, you know, future prevention um, for for these folks because it's addressing their basic needs, and that's how important housing is addressing the basic needs of individuals who because of circumstance have been dealt incredibly difficult um, hands by the very system that um, is, is incarcerating, putting them behind bars or, or, or um, giving them these other, other situations where they're not allowed to really feel empowered to change their lives. So we view housing as a way of, of um, giving them the path of, of self-empowerment um, and um, really meeting their basic needs so that they can thrive in the future. And that's where we need to start. It, it's, we believe in the housing first model. This um, campaign really uh, elevates the importance of fulfilling that mission as well. Thank you for that, Julia. Really appreciated that we were able to to, to, to squeeze that in. Uh, in the interest of time, let me uh, just return to, to Hannah. Hannah, um, uh, I want a, a similar question. Uh, what's next uh, for the work for Vera, uh, for this partnership? Uh, how do you uh, uh, build on and, and continue to really sustain uh, this significant progress? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think as, as you've heard everyone say, there's a lot still left to do. Um, but I do think this is a really critical moment for the work. Um, we're seeing interest from counties across the state. Folks want to have these difficult discussions. They're hungry for concrete, tangible solutions. Um, and, you know, everyone on the panel has, has touched on some of the work that still needs to happen in Santa Clara. We're really excited about um, staying in Santa Clara, formalizing um, some of these practice changes, as, as Judge Lucero mentioned. And at the same time, we really want to build on the success of this work. We want to leverage the growing momentum um, and develop mechanisms to share out the lessons that we've learned and start replicating the model that we've built in, in Santa Clara and other places um, across the state. So we're working with all the folks on this panel to develop a toolkit that can take stakeholders through the change process in Santa Clara. Um, and then we were also um, partnering with Jess and, and Young Women's Freedom Center more deeply in some of the places where they already have um, a presence to think about how can we apply and adapt the model that's worked so well in Santa Clara in other places uh, across the state. Um, and, and we're also working on a report, as you mentioned, with YWFC that's gonna detail what are those county by county numbers, set some benchmarks for the state so that folks across the state within counties can really start driving towards zero. And what are some policy recommendations that are driven by data, but also driven by directly impacted young folks, by women, by gender expansive folks who have been impacted by the system can tell us what some of those policy recommendations need to be. Um, and then I think the last thing I'd say is we want to find the next Santa Clara or Santa Clara's, right? We're getting, um, we're, we're engaging a broader group of counties uh, across the state. We want to work with our champions in Santa Clara to bring folks together, to incubate new solutions. And when we find places that are willing to roll up their sleeves, um, we'll be ready to offer deeper technical assistance and, and help them get to zero. I think Santa Clara is the first of many counties to, to set this goal and, and to work towards zero. And so we're really, really hopeful for what the future can hold for this work. Thank you. Uh, you know, we are out of time, uh, unfortunately, but I, I just want to say how simply inspired I am by uh, the robust leadership that this partnership um, represents. And so want to thank all of our uh, viewers, all of our audience members for joining us. Uh, thank you to this incredible panel, uh, which is uh, focused and together focused is implementing additional solutions 
to sustain this work around zero incarcerated girls uh, for the future. Um, at Cal Wellness, uh, we are simply incredibly uh, proud to be partners uh, in this work. Um, for those of you who are seeking additional information, who want to learn more uh, about the work and how you can support it, I encourage you to reach out to Anna Green or Lindsay Rosenthal at Vera uh, for more information. Uh, thank you all. Uh, have a great rest of uh, the day and week um, and onward uh, until uh, this work uh, is done. Thank you so much.